start the recording now. Uh, so thank you very much to uh, Tom Klukowski for uh, stepping in um, last minute to replace Livia. Uh, so Tom is a senior at Hertfordshire University, uh, and he will be talking to us about the amphetohedron and positive geometries. So let me actually, just before you get started, let me mention that if somebody wants to ask a question during the lecture, uh, feel free to raise your hand and uh, uh, Tomic will call on you. So uh, go for it, Tomic, it's all yours. Uh, thank you. So thanks a lot for the, for the invitation and uh, for this possibility to, to give these talks here. Uh, so there will be four lectures uh, focused on positive geometries, uh, but with the aim to, to explain what amplitudron is. So if you've, you've never heard what amplitudron is, I hope that by the end of this of these four lectures, you will know what amplitudron is and what the momentum amplitudron is and how to use them to uh, to find um, amplitude, scattering amplitude in n equals to four supporting meals. Uh, in the first case, in the planar sector, in the second case, uh, for three level uh, amplitudes. So uh, I, I listed here some um, uh, references. So the first reference is a, uh, is a review which I wrote with Livia and uh, uh, it contains a lot of information uh, as, as a good starting point, I think, for uh, positive geometries in general, but also for amphitheodron. So if you if you want to refer to something more uh, deep or broad, then then there's a lot of information there. But I will also, I mean, my uh, everything I, I will speak, I will talk about here is uh, based on uh, mostly on work of Nimar Kanihamed and the group around him, and then later some other people. So there are some some uh, papers by Nima, uh, one when the amphitheodron itself was introduced, then uh, the so-called AB, ABHY uh, paper where the asasahedron, uh, which I will talk about today, uh, was introduced, and the last one about positive geometries, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is a notion which just takes all this uh, uh, geometric objects like amphitheodron, asasahedron, and also other objects, and uh, put them in one simple uh, single framework uh, positive geometry. So I, what I would do, I will try to explain what positive geometries are and where uh, scattering amplitudes, uh, where they fit in there. So the first lecture, uh, I, I'll start slow. Uh, it will be an introduction. So it's many things probably you, you've already heard. Uh, I also, uh, I listened to, to the talk uh, in the morning by Kai and there are some things there which would be very useful for, for us today. So uh, especially uh, things about co color ordering. So I might repeat some of these things but then I hope that by the end of the of this first lecture, you will be able to appreciate why the geometry is a natural language to describe scattering amplitudes. So that's that's my goal for this lecture to 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 start from something very simple from phi cube theory, slightly modified phi cube, phi cube theory, and uh, explain to you how geometry arises in this context. Okay, but what I will do, I will start from some introductions, some general introduction. Uh, and motivation, why, what we are doing and why we are doing it. So I think that for this audience, most, most of you are working in uh, scattering amplitudes anyways, but uh, for many high energy, uh, high energy physicists, uh, the particle physics is the, uh, the topic which they want to study. So we want to understand how particles uh, behave, how, how they in, uh, interact. And we know for many, many years now that particle physics is very well described by uh, perturbative uh, QFT. So we know what quantum field theory is and how to use it. And in particular, we know some old techniques uh, which are which are tested and, and used for like 50 years now, or even more than 50 years. And they're very successful in predicting uh, what's, what's going on for, uh, for, for particles and in particle physics. So the central objects, uh, and these are the objects which we'll study here. So central objects are of course, scattering amplitudes. Uh, so I have some picture here. So when we think about scattering amplitudes, we think about some process where there is some particles incoming. Maybe there are some particles outgoing, but in this context, we will think about all of the particles incoming. So there's some momenta uh, and there's N of such particles with some specified momenta. Uh, and they interact in some way. And what, we, what we'd like to do, we'd like to find what this, uh, what this interaction is. So scattering amplitudes, uh, so processes like this would be the, the main topic here. And why do we do that? Why, why, 
why we are interested in scattering amplitudes. So first of all, the, they are, the reason why we study, study them is that because they describe how, particle, how particles interact. So they, they describe interaction between particles. And, uh, and more importantly, uh, they provide some link between the theory and the experiment. So uh, predictions from the calculations for scattering amplitudes can be then tested in experiments. So what they do also, they provide the link uh, between theory, theory and experiment. But sometimes, and this is one of my main, main motivations when I, I studied uh, uh, positive geometries and uh, scattering amplitudes in, um, uh, more, more broadly, is that a lot of developments in scattering amplitudes, they just tell us something more about the world around us and about the QFT uh, so, uh, as a theory. Uh, so they, they are just driving force, force for many developments in QFT in general. Okay, so a lot of methods which, which were discovered in, in scattering amplitudes then later could be used also in other contexts in quantum field theory. And in particular, uh, uh, I mean, one of the things which, which are important is that they, they, they give us something, these new methods, they give us a new way of thinking about quantum field theory. So a new way of, of, of looking at it. So just going away uh, from, from the perspective of Feynman and trying to understand it in, in more modern uh, more modern, modern way. Okay, so so what are scattering amplitudes? As I, I, I said, they describe this process where there's some particles incoming and there's something going on, but for us, the, 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 the main statement, what scattering amplitudes are, so they are functions. Uh, a picky person will say uh, distributions because there is a, a momentum conservation delta function, but there are functions of some kinematics. Okay, so we have our momenta, and uh, what scattering amplitude is, is just a function of this momenta. So depending how the momenta change, the, the function changes itself. Okay, and uh, so uh, what we would like to do, what we, uh, what we are trying to, to find is what, what these functions really are. So how they depend, how, how the scattering amplitude depends on kinematics. And we want to do that because if later on we want to compare it with experiments, in experiments we can, uh, we can find some quantities. For example, we can, we can talk about cross sections in experiments, and uh, if we want to do, if you want to find them, we can use our scattering amplitudes. Take this uh, curry A, and just take the absolute value square, and the cross sections will be proportional to the subject. So if we know what the scattering amplitude is, we can make some predictions for experiment for the experiment uh, experiments. Okay, so that's that's the motivation why uh, the, uh, the the scattering amplitudes are interesting. Uh, the other question is how. So how how can we find these this functions? How how can we find the explicit explicit form of these functions of kinematic variables? So there are some standard methods for that. So the, the ones which we are probably familiar with. So I, I assume that you are familiar with. We will not use a lot of them, but some of them would be important. So what are the standard methods of quantum field theory? Uh, we use Lagrangians. Every theory has its Lagrangian, which can be written down explicitly, uh, not for all of them, but for the, the ones which we will study here. And then we use the, this Lagrangian to derive Feynman rules and then use Feynman diagrams in order to, um, to, to find what the scattering amplitudes are. Okay, so that's that's the old method. Uh, that, that's uh, the, the one which was uh, the very beginning of quantum field theory uh, was used and is still successfully used. However, it has problems. So this, this method of using Feynman diagrams has problems. Uh, one of the problems is that it quickly becomes very difficult to compute. So it's very difficult to use. So the number of Feynman diagrams, as we know, you probably heard in many talks uh, you went to for, uh, uh, about scattering amplitudes, that if you increase the number of legs, the number of particles scattering, when, when you increase the, the loop order, uh, the number of Feynman diagrams increases exponentially. And uh, at some point, this, this method is just not tractable. So you, you cannot use it uh, beyond some point because there are not, not enough computer power to do that. Okay, so, so one, one of the problems is that this quickly become very difficult. 
to compute, but not even to compute, sometimes even to, to, to find, to classify, to, to, to find all possible diagrams, it's just impossible uh, for some number of loops, for some number of, uh, of particle scattering. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the answer, so the final answers are very often much simpler than the calculations themselves. So they are often simpler than the intermediate calculations. So what you can do, you can, you can take your uh, Feynman, Feynman diagrams, Feynman rules, just evaluate these amplitudes and then uh, simplify the final answer as much as you can. And then you realize that you, you've done a lot of these calculations with hundreds, hundreds of thousands and millions of, of uh, Feynman diagrams, but the final answer can be written in one line. So that's very, very often uh, what happens here. And this just points, uh, points to the fact that probably the Feynman diagrams are not the best way of calculating these things. And uh, we know reasons for that. So the, uh, the Feynman diagrams are quite often obscure symmetries of the, uh, of the theory. They, uh, there are some additional red redundancies which you need to introduce, uh, which uh, final answer do not have. And, and for that reason, the, the, the calculations are difficult, but then the answer can be quite simple, okay? So this is something which we would like to avoid. We would like to have a method where the, the properties of the final answers are just embedded in the formulas, okay? So we would like to find something which can replace the final diagrams and, and the Lagrangian approach to perturbative quantum field theory uh, and be able to use this new, new, new approach in order to to find the answers in much, much easier and simpler and faster way, okay? So instead of doing that, so instead, so I'll not talk much about final diagrams. We'll use them just for generating some answers, which then we will explain in a different way. But uh, uh, instead of that, we would, what we would like to do, we would like to understand uh, the amplitudes uh, directly uh, in, so, so what amplitude is, amplitude is a function of kinematic space, of kinematic variables. So what we'd like to do, we'd like to uh, understand scattering amplitudes directly in this kinematic space. So directly in uh, kinematic space. And it turns out that it's possible, at least for some theories, not for, I mean, we don't know the answer for all of them, for example, for, uh, for QCD, uh, at the moment, there's no positive geometry associated to QCD. But uh, uh, in these lectures, for some simpler theories, uh, uh, like uh, phi cube theory, the scalar phi cube theory, or for n equals to four super n meals, in that case, it is possible to understand the answer directly in the kinematic space and avoid all these calculations using Feynman vectors. Okay? And this, this method, the method which I will explain, uh, is a geometric method. It's, an, it's a quite novel. It's, uh, it started 2013 uh, in a paper by, by Nimar Kani Hamad. Uh, so it's eight years now. It's a quite modern, uh, quite novel method. And it's, it relies on geometry. So there's a novel geometric construction. And the, the notion which I want to introduce here, uh, which just, just uh, take, takes this method and just, just um, give names to this, all these kind of geometric methods uh, is positive geometries. So the, the name suggests that uh, this method would be geometric, but it also suggests that there will be something about positivity of something, which I will explain later, which would be important. Okay, so we'll talk about positivity quite a lot. And it turns out that positivity is quite a um, uh, fundamental notion uh, in scattering amplitudes. Okay, so just to give you a flavor of what, what, where, we, where we are aiming, uh, so what, what is the statement uh, I would like to show you is that the amplitudes turns out to be, so they're encoded as uh, some particular, uh, differential forms. I will explain all this, all these notions in, in, in the following lectures. So there will be something about differential forms. So that, that's one one odd type of objects which we will we, we need here. On some regions, quite often there are bounded regions. So there's some geometry, there's some space, and there are some regions in this space. 
uh, but these regions are usually in the kinematic space uh, that is appropriate for our problem. So uh, depending which problem we are studying, there will be different kinematic spaces with which, which would be relevant. For example, for example, for scalar theory, then natural space is a space of Mandelstam variables. Uh, but when you go to n equals to four, uh, it's a spinor helicity space, which is more natural. Or uh, just, just following the, the morning lecture, if you go to, if you use the, the fact that the Wilson loops and the scattering amplitudes in, n equals, in planar n equals to four are dual to each other, you can describe scattering amplitudes using the dual coordinates uh, or momentum twisters. Okay, so depending which problem we are studying, we will have different set of kinematic variables. But the important thing is that the, there will be some geometry on the space of kinematic variables, and there will be some, so there will be some shape, and we will define some algebraic object, some uh, algebraic uh, uh, quantity, uh, which will be a differential form, which will encode scattering amplitude. Okay, so that's that's the statement which I would like you to understand at the end of these four lectures. That uh, for some theorists, it is possible to find this. So to understand which region on kinematic space we need to consider how to find this differential form uh, and how to extract amplitude from this differential form. Okay, so that's that's uh, what what my motivation for this series of four lectures are. Uh, anytime you have any question, please stop me. Uh, you can raise your hand. I I think that I will be able to see it. You can also write in chat. I I quite uh, I mean I can quite easily read what is written in the chat, so I can immediately answer also to these questions. Okay, so if there are any questions, please, please let me know. So what's the lecture content? So I, I have four lectures and hopefully I'll manage to cover all of it. So today, uh, what I want to do, I want to focus on motivating why geometry can arise in uh, scattering amplitude world. So there will be some first example and it will be a very simple example, a so-called adjoint scalar field theory. Uh, which will lead us to uh, a geometry uh, which has a name, it's a polytope, uh, which is called the asosahedron. So I want to start quite, quite from some quite simple example where you can, you can just take the, 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 the um, uh, method which you already know. So Feynman diagrams just calculate this uh, scattering amplitudes in this theory and then see that there is really a geometry attached to this, this scattering amplitude. Okay, so this is, for, uh, this is the topic of today. And then tomorrow, I will give you a formal definition uh, of positive geometries. So I, I would, there be, it will be a bit mathy. So, so the positive geometries, is a, they, they have a mathematical definition, which is very, very, uh, I mean, it's very, very strict. Uh, but it's important to understand it in order to, to be able to see that all these other geometries which we really discuss, they satisfy these uh, uh, conditions. So I will introduce the definition of positive geometries and give you some simple examples. So it turns out that every convex polytope can be thought of as a positive geometry. So what I would try to explain, I would try to explain that uh, and build an intuition of what positive geometry is, just studying a simple polytopes, convex polytopes, like simplices or uh, a quadrilateral, for example, okay? And then in the third, third lecture, uh, we go to something which is a bit more complicated. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a curvy version of polytopes and it, it is based on, on, the, on the notion which is also quite well known for mathematicians, which is called positive Grassmannian. Okay, and then finally, the final lecture, uh, I will talk about some true amplitudes uh, which we are interested in. So I'll talk about n equals to four super n meals. And I'll talk about two things, depending on time, really. Uh, so planar free uh, amplitudes. Uh, which are given by the, the famous amplitohedron. And then if time allows, then only about three, three level amplitudes, but beyond the planar limit. So three amplitudes, uh, which are given by uh, the, the so-called momentum amplitohedron. Okay, 
So hopefully I managed to, to go through these topics. And at the end, as I said, uh, at the end, you will, you will be able to see how these positive geometries are related to amplitudes, which maybe you, you study yourself. Um, important thing to, to say here is that I only focus on three level amplitudes. And the reason is that they are just kind of easier to visualize and geometries are not so complicated. But for example, for the amplitudehedron, there, there are extensions also to, to loop levels and integrands of uh, loop level amplitudes can be encoded also in geometry. And there's some ongoing work now uh, also for this uh, simple uh, adjoint scalar field theory or by adjoint scalar field theory, uh, where also the uh, generalization to loop order is possible and integrands of this uh, of these amplitudes are encoded in some geometry again. Okay, so this is this is what I'm planning to do today. So let me try to so let me start by explaining what I mean by this adjoint scalar field theory. So some of you might be uh, familiar with a notion of bi-adjoint scalar theory, but uh, everything which I want to explain here, it's, you, we don't have to go to bi-adjoint theory as one adjoint uh, is sufficient. Uh, so what we'll do, we'll consider a scalar theory. So it's a theory, quantum theory of scalars, so scalar field theory with a very simple interaction. So just cubic interaction. And we know how to approach, how to find this, this kind of uh, scattering amplitudes. So what we, what we usually do, what we start with, we derive Feynman rules and Feynman diagrams. Uh, so we use perturbation theory, right? So we assume that the perturbation, so the interaction is, is weak. And then we can take the cutting constant and take our amplitude and just write it in, in expansion, uh, where the first, first term uh, is at the three level amplitude plus some G times uh, second term, some one loop contribution plus uh, two loop contribution plus higher loop contributions, where this G is just a coupling constant. And we assume it's it's small. So, so this, this is a meaningful uh, expansion. Uh, and as I said, we'd be mostly interested here in this uh, three level because uh, first of all, uh, a lot of things which are relevant for uh, a lot of things which come from uh, positive geometries can be already explained at three level. That's, that's the first statement. The second statement is that anytime we talk about um, loop level amplitudes, we need to integrate over uh, Feynman momenta, optional momenta. And this is a separate process, which is still not understood from the point, point of view of geometry. So that would be interesting, something maybe one of you will, will manage to solve how to take the integrands which we know from geometry and then integrate uh, in some geometric way. But there are standard ways, but there, no, there is no geometric way at the moment. Okay, so we take the uh, scalar field theory, cubic interaction, so this phi cube theory, so something which you learn in your first QFT uh, uh, lecture, really, and the first QFT course, but we do something with it. So we additionally, Additionally, uh, we will say that the fields, so the scalar fields, they transform in an adjoint, so adjoint representation of uh, the group, let's take UN here. Uh, so you can think about this as some kind of gauge group. So I just put here a gauge in a bracket. So think about this as a, uh, as a gauge theory, really, but there are no gauge fields. They're just scalar fields, but the scalar fields are just matrices. Uh, so they, they transform the adjoint of this uh, gauge, gauge in quotation group UN. Okay. So you, you heard in the, in the talk in the morning uh, that in that case, when you have, uh, so you have some kind of color structure now, uh, we have generators of this gauge group. And what we can do, we, instead of talking about the full amplitude, we can decompose the amplitude into trace decomposition. So color decomposition of this amplitude. So you, you can find that, that at least at the, at the three level, there is a very simple way of uh, writing the amplitude using so-called partial amplitudes. OK, so what we can do, we can take color factors 
which can be written in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the generators the generators of the cage group and the, there's a factorization at least at the three level there's a factorization which tells us uh, up to some conventional g to n, n minus two here uh, but we can write the amplitude in terms of traces of this t uh, so t are generators so let me just write it here so t a i are generators of uh, un so they are just matrices uh, because we are in a joint. So there is some a, a1 here and then a, and then I will explain in a second what, what I mean by this convention here, by this notation. So this is a trace of T a1, T a sigma two up to T a sigma n times uh, a straight a. So this is now a straight a three level, which will now depend on some, um, uh, on some ordering. So these are partial amplitudes sigma two up to sigma n, where the sum here goes over, so let's call this on, where this on is uh, just all permutations, these are all the, yeah, all the permutations uh, with the cyclic permutations removed, because, because of the properties of the trace, uh, we can always move around uh, all these t's, so that we can always put the first of it, so the first one, in the first position, and then just permute all the all the remaining ones. So the all the permutations which we are interested in are just n minus one factorial permutations. So this is a set of n minus one factorial permutations. Um, of n particles with particle one in the first in the first position. Okay, so the statement is that what we can do, you just using uh, uh, using the fact that the everything is uh, is written, <clears throat> so using the fact that there is this color structure, we can decompose our amplitude into uh, a color structure which depends on the generators of the gauge group times something. So this something is called the partial amplitude. So partial amplitude. Which depends on the kinematics, so only on momentum. There's no color structure anymore here. But the important thing is that this partial amplitudes they will now depend on the ordering. So there will be some ordering. So anytime I take any sigma from this s n minus one, uh, which means that th these are some numbers. Uh, so that I permute my particles. There is some particular ordering in which I have so that uh, the, this this uh, amplitudes are ordered using this color structure. Okay. So this a a and three, so the straight A and three, uh, one, let's say one, two up to N is just a partial amplitude that depends only on, on the kinematic data, depends only on kinematic data. So if you compare this formula uh, to the one uh, I, I see question. I just finished my comment, and then I will I will answer the question. Uh, so if you compare it, if you compare it with the formula from the morning, uh, so in the morning there, there was uh, uh, the formula of, was for gluons. There was some additional information which we, we need to put here. You need to put helicities of of your particles, right? So the gluons have helicities. So each of this particle will also depend on the. I mean, this this um, partial amplitudes will also depend on helicities. In this case, we are talking just about scalar fields, so there are no helicities, and the only thing which is important is the momentum of the of the particle. Okay, there is a question. Uh, yeah, hi. So, uh, what would be the cubic coupling for these adjoint scalars uh, in the Lagrangian? I I don't remember. So there will be some trace of phi cube. Really. I see. Because because for bi joint, what happens is if there are two uh, uh, structure constants. Then the term is consistent. If you have F A B C F A prime B prime C prime and phi A A prime phi B B prime phi C C prime, that mm -hmm. is consistent with the anti-symmetry of the structure constant. But if you have only one adjoint index, then I'm a bit confused because F A B C would be anti-symmetric 
but phi a phi b phi c would be symmetric uh, Uh, so there's a paper by Song uh, where this was written explicitly. I don't remember uh, the reference, but uh, uh, okay. uh, but I, I try to find that and then then okay. okay? All right. Yeah. Uh, so I I decided to do this adjoint adjoint scalar uh, because uh, the only thing the only statement which is really important here is that. So if we take by a joint and what we would have, we would have uh, two structures like this, right? And then the amplitude here, uh, the partial amplitude will depend on two different orderings. Uh, but the point is that uh, then to, to find the, the associahedron, which I want to find, we would take both of these orderings the same. So we would restrict yeah, yeah. To both of them identical. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, so, so here that the only important thing, the only important thing is that when we take this partial, partial amplitudes, then the only, only planar Feynman diagrams contribute. Okay, and that's that's the only statement I want, right? So in, that, that would be true for the biojoint, uh, but in this case, just, just, just the planar Feynman diagrams will contribute here. So you cannot just take five cube theory. In that case, yeah, the construction would not work. Uh, the way we would like to, but if we take the this adjoint, uh, sorry, if you take the partial amplitudes, uh, like like here, then only the planar final items contribute. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. So so let's see. So this is this is a theory, uh, right? And then what we can do, we can um, uh, we can try to calculate some of the some of the amplitudes in this theory. Okay. So. You just re I mean remember what is the uh, what the final rules should be, and uh, the only kind of vertices which we will have that will be uh, trivalent ver vertices, and these are the only ones which we need to use, and uh, we can just calculate partial amplitudes for some small number of particles. Uh, so the simplest one which we can calculate really is uh, a three particle, one, right? So this is the, the first non-trivial one. So if I if I calculate if I find what the Feynman diagram here is, so this is the only Feynman diagram which we contribute here, and uh, there's no there's no internal propagator, and we took took care of the so we put this g n minus two here just to to get rid of all um, uh, capping constants, all the powers of capping constants. So the only thing, this I mean, this is just a number. There's nothing it can depend on. So the answer for this one is just equal to one. So the three, three particle uh, amplitude is just equal to one. Okay, so that, that's simple. But let's see something a bit more complicated. So let's take a four particle. Okay, so as I said, so in, in the five cube theory, we found that adjoint, what we would do for four, four particle uh, scattering amplitude, we would have three diagrams, the S channel, T channel, and U channel. But the point is that here, what we'll do, uh, I mean, we, we only have to take the, the planar diagrams in our particle ordering. So the ordering which I take here is one, two, three, four, which means that the particles are ordered on the disk uh, from one to four, let's say uh, counterclockwise. And the only diagrams which I can draw are the planar diagrams. So there are no, no edges, so no, no, no propagators can, can cross. So there are just two of them. So the S channel and T channel and U channel, uh, which is not planar, will not contribute here. Okay, so I can do. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so I'm sorry if it, this is a stupid question, but it's not clear to me why the three particle amplitude is trivial. Uh, there's no. Uh, so, so it's important. So this this is a massless uh, this is a massless uh, theory. So I didn't say that, but it should be massless theory. But uh, there's no uh, Lorentz invariant which can construct from p1, p2, and p3 other than a constant. I mean, the, the, the only scalars are Lorentz invariant. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. Right, because so so usually what 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 uh, so the amplitude usually depends on Mandelstam variables, right? In 
In this case, you could think about the Mandelstam variable, which looks like this, p1 plus p2 square. But because of the momentum conservation, that's the same as minus p3 square. But for massless theory, that's just equal to 0. So it's not. Uh, so that's not something which we which we need to consider. So only the scalars. So there's no there's no non-trivial uh, Mandelstam invariant in that case. Okay. So that the, the the answer has to be a constant, and in that case, it's just one. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, the story is slightly different for four points because in this case you can construct uh, uh, you can construct invariants, and in particular this one it will just contribute as one over t. And then the second one, so second diagram is the S channel diagram, so P1, P2, P3, and P4. In that case, it's one over S, where the T is just P1 plus P2 square, oh, sorry, uh, that's T, so P2 plus P3 square, and T, sorry, and S is P1 plus P2 square. Okay, so these are invariants. Uh, sometimes, and just, just, uh, just uh, thinking ahead, uh, instead of this uh, convention of ST and U for four particles, we will use a uh, general Mandelstam variables. So we call them S23 and S12. So S, S, uh, I, J is just PI plus PJ square. And then one can construct also a three particle Mandelstam. So S, I, J, K, that's P1. Pi plus Pj plus Pk square, and so on, all the Mandelstams with uh, more and more indices. Okay, so that's the answer. So the answer is just the sum of these two terms. Okay, so now uh, let's do one more. Uh, so let's do five points, and then the six points I leave for you as an exercise for the for this afternoon for the for the tutorial session, and you you can find the uh, the questions in in the Slack channel. So let's do five points. So for five points, again, let's take three level in the ordering one, two, three, four, five. And again, so what we need to do, we need to take uh, five external momenta, but we need to order them in, in such a way that they, that P1, uh, P2, P3, P4, and P5, uh, that they are ordered. And then we need to find all the planar, planar diagrams which uh, contribute here. So, so there be, so maybe I can ask uh, uh, how many how many diagrams can I find? I can find this this diagram, for example, right? So that's one of them. Yeah, sorry, that's not the one. That's that's one diagram. Uh, how many more I can find? Yes, it's five in total. That's true. So I, I'm not draw all of them. I leave it for you as an exercise. So there's far four more, more of them. But I, you will see immediately how they should look like. So there are just this diagram, just rotated by uh, by one. I mean, just 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 permuted the, the labels by by one, just giving all five permutations of this the cyclic permutations of this diagram. Okay. But what we what we are really interested in, we are interested in associating. Uh, an expression, algebraic expression to this diagram. So we know just using Feynman rules, uh, this will be proportional to S12, S34, because we have two internal momenta, right? In, uh, yeah, so th this one is P1 plus P2, and this one is P3 plus P4. Okay, not this one, sorry. This one is P3 plus P4. So, just using, using Feynman rules, we know that the, this contribution from this diagram will be one over S12, uh, one over S34. And then what we can do, we can just write explicitly the, the contributions from the, the remaining four diagrams. So uh, as I said, they are just cyclic permutations of this one. So we, let's, let's just do that. So this is S23, S45 plus one over S34, S15 plus one over S45, S12 plus one over S15, S23. So these are the five contributions. So this is the full amplitude in that case, okay? And now, so what I want to do, and now I want to take this answer, and then I want to explain uh, how this answer can lead us to geometry, 
Okay, so let's just study this answer, which we found from Feynman calculations. But now what we'd like to do, we'd like to interpret this uh, and associate some geometry to it. Uh, and let's see, so let, let, let's start from the following observation. So the observation is just looking at the, at the, the explicit expression for this amplitude. So first observation is that this amplitude is divergent when uh, either of the five Mandelstams goes to zero, right? So if S12 goes to zero, the, there is a pole there. So this, this amplitude is divergent, which is, uh, is a natural thing because we know that the amplitude should diverge when uh, two particles go collinear. So, uh, and uh, the same happens if you take S23 to zero, S34 and so on. So there are five singularities of this answer. It's a function with five poles in this kinematic space. So, so what we observe, we observe that A5 goes to, so I dropped all the indices. So I dropped three and I dropped the, the square brackets. So just, just taking, I'm just taking this. Uh, it goes to infinity when N S I I plus one goes to zero, right? Because they are in the denominator. But there's something more which we can say about that. It's not only that it's divergent, but we also can study what the divergence is. So we can just take it and calculate a residue when S12, say, goes to zero. So what we can do, we can take a residue, S12 goes to, equals to zero of our A5. Okay, so, so what we need to do, we just need to look at our, our answer here and uh, S12 is here in the denominator and it's here. So there's in this five expressions, uh, the, the divergence only is in these two expressions. So the residue from the remaining three will be zero, but from this two, we'll get an answer. Uh, and the answer is one over S34 plus one over S45. Okay, so that's, that's the answer. And the important thing is that we can interpret this, this answer, which we found directly from the, the, our uh, Feynman calculations. Uh, so we can interpret it uh, in pictures. So how, how can we do that? So if you, if you look at this answer, it is very similar to the answer which we found here, right? It looks like a four particle, uh, four particles scattering amplitude with some other particles involved. So there's not one, two, three, four, but there are some other ones, so three, four, and and five is involved, but we can, we can just interpret this statement in the following picture. So if you take our five point amplitude with five incoming momenta, so P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, when we take S12 to zero, the answer, so the residue looks like a, a full particle amplitude with P3, sorry, P5, P4, P3 coming in, and something else has to come in here. So let's let's find it in a second. And then you, you don't see it, but I, I write this answer in a very particular way. I just multiply it by one, uh, just, just to be able to write and to draw what, I, what I'm trying to draw now, because we know what one is. One is just a three-part amplitude. So A3, uh, I decided to, to just put P2 and P1 as incoming momenta. And then there is some uh, additional particle here, okay? So what happens is that on, the, on this pole, on the pole where the S12, so on the singularity of the, of the original amplitude, uh, the five particle amplitude, the, the amplitude, uh, it splits. So the residue of the amplitude, it splits, it factorizes into two contributions. One is a three particle amplitude, which we know is equal to one, and the other is a four particle amplitude. So if you write the, the, the answer here, you'll find that this is just S as we have above, S uh, one over S34 plus one over S45, okay? So that is a product of two amplitudes. So the residue of the, so at, at, the, at the position of the pole where S12 goes to zero, the residue is just is a product of two amplitudes. Where I didn't, I, I haven't connect here. Uh, so there's no, no connection here because otherwise it would look like a Feynman propagator, but it's not a Feynman propagator. So there's the contribution from this 
this edges here, this uh, uh, lines here is just uh, equal to one. So there is no propagator here. But later on, just to make uh, life easier, I will always connect it. So, so if you see something like this, it's not a Feynman diagram now, it's a factorization channel now. Okay, the factorization channel, which you need to interpret as a product of two amplitudes, a three particle amplitude and a four particle amplitude. And uh, there is some momentum, uh, there's no momentum flowing because it's equal to zero, because we put S1 put to zero, but you can think about this as some momentum P1 plus P2, which in our case is zero. Sorry, it's not zero, it's unsure. So, so, so there is some, there, there might be some momentum. Okay, so, so the answer is that when we take the residue of A5, the, the amplitude factorizes. But the interesting thing is that that's not the only factorization channel which we have. We have five of them because if you look back into our explicit form of our amplitude, it has five poles. So what we can do, we can now take these five poles and try to take all possible factorizations. And I'll do a picture uh, which will just reflect how this factorization works. Okay, so. So if I start with my five particle amplitude, uh, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, I can have, I can take S12 going to zero. So this is the, the factorization channel which we, so this is the factorization of the, or the residue which we studied already. And we know what happens in that case. In that case, there is a split into a, a three particle and a four particle uh, amplitude in the, in the following way. So P1 and P2 is on one side and P3, 4, and 5 on the other side. But I can take some other limits. So let me take, uh, for example, S3, 4 going to zero. And in that case, uh, you, can, you can, again, go back to the original uh, expression we found using uh, final diagrams. And then you can, you can calculate what the answer is. And you, again, can, can show that the answer is a product of two amplitudes, where one of them is a four particle amplitude uh, involving P1, P5, oh, sorry, no, not this one. Uh, it should be uh, P1, P2, and P5. And a three particle amplitude uh, involving P3 and P4. Okay, so this is, this is, um, this is another factorization channel. Now I'll do all five of them. Uh, for the reason you will, you will see in a second. Okay, so what we, what we think about now, so we, we are in the kinematic space and in this kinematic space, the, in, in the bulk, the S's are just generic numbers. But when we, when we take one of the S, so S12 or S34 to zero, we are just moving inside of our kinematic space. We approach some boundary. There's some boundary there on which the S12 is equal to zero. And on this boundary on, the, on our kinematic space, something happens. So what happens is that our amplitude, it factorizes into two, in the product of two amplitudes. Okay, so you can think about the bulk of our uh, kinematic space with some boundaries. One of the boundaries when S12 goes to zero or is equal to zero. Uh, the other one is S34 uh, equal to zero. And we have, we have three more factorizations. So I write this one S45 going to zero. So in this case, it's uh, a four and a five goes together and then uh, P1, P2, P3 is, is part of the uh, four particle uh, amplitude. We can also take uh, S23 uh, equals to zero. And then in that case, we find uh, P1, P5, P4, and two and three are together, P2, P3. And then finally, what we can take, we can take uh, S15 equal to zero. And in that case, the factorization looks like so P1 and P5 are together. And then there's a four particle. Uh, I see a question, I I'll come to the question in a second. Um, P2, P3, and P4. Okay, uh, I take the question. Okay, sorry. Uh, I just hear you mentioned about the boundaries and Nima, I, I think that Nima mentioned many boundaries, different boundaries. So I just want to make sure when you mention boundary, what is the exactly region you are, you are you want to say? Is that the per, just a parameter space or what? Okay, so at the moment, I, I just want to uh, explain 
everything in a combinatorial way. So I would just want to say that the amplitude has some structure when you approach boundaries uh, in a kinematic space where something happens. Okay, so there are some regions, uh, non-generic regions in the kinematic space where uh, amplitudes factorize. Now, later on, uh, I will introduce for you an explicit construction, uh, construction where these boundaries will be visible for us. And you will see in a second, I mean, you already probably can see that there's some pentagon here. And I will tell you where this pentagon lives. It, it lives in a kinematic space of uh, this Mandelstam's, but it, it lives in some subspace. It's not in the top dimensional five, five dimensional space. It's, it lives in some two dimensional sub, linear subspace inside. So one can, one can see this pentagon explicitly in the kinematic space with these boundaries explicitly in the kinematic space. Okay, thank you for uh, for answer. Yeah. Okay, so so that this is this is these are these five factorization channels, but now we can do something more. So so remember that when we took the uh, this factorization here, so s one to going to zero, uh, our answer was just one over s three four plus one over s four five, which means that this answer here. Uh, is still divergent. It's far, there is a far, further divergence when we take other s's to zero. So, for example, if I now take this factorization here and I take uh, here s34 going to zero, I pick up a residue here, right? Non zero residue. And then the answer will be equal to one, but I will interpret this one in a very particular way. So, how do I interpret that? I will just um, just erase that. I'll just so one is uh, one times one times one. I will interpret it as a factorization into three three particle uh, amplitudes. Okay, so what I find here, this one will be just a product of p one, p two, p three. I'm sorry, I, I did it wrong. Was more. So P1 and P2 are together. And then P5 goes here. And then P3 and P4. Okay. So I just interpret this, this uh, limit here as a further factorization uh, into uh, a product of three. Uh, three particle uh, amplitudes now. Again, this, these are not propagators. This is not the Feynman diagram, it's just a factorization channel. Okay. And then I can do the same here, for example, in a different direction. So in the opposite direction here, uh, you remember that this, this was one over S34 plus one over S45. So I have also I can also take S45 uh, going to zero here, and then also uh, get another factorization. So sorry, let me. We just do it slightly differently. Uh, so S for five going to zero. And what will happen is that here I find another picture which I need to draw a bit above. So the other picture which I find here is that P5 and P4 will be together. And then uh, P1 and P2 will be together. And then P3 will be down here. Okay, so this is another factorization channel. So again, the answer, so the second residue, uh, the answer is one, but I, I interpret one as a product of these three ones, one coming from this three particle amplitude, another three particle amplitude, and the third one. Okay, and I could do the same everywhere. So I could, I could, uh, I could take another one. I could take this one, for example. Uh, uh, so this, this factorization channel. So this factorization channel here, uh, if I take the residue of my original amplitude when S34 goes to zero, the answer which I find is one over S12 plus one over uh, S15. Uh, you can trust me on that, or you can just calculate yourself. And again, this is an amplitude which I can factorize, I can take further residue. So I can take a residue when S12 goes to zero or S15 goes to zero. Okay. So I could I could complete I could complete this picture with uh, uh, three additional uh, full factorizations, and uh, and what I get I get the following the following picture. So I'm just try to draw it. Okay, so I get a picture of a pentagon where 
what I mean, this is only a combinatorial picture at the moment. Uh, later on, I'll try to explain a bit more uh, how, how it can be really, I mean, make, make, how this picture can be made solid. And this, this is one of, one of the papers which I cited at the very beginning that describes how to make it, make it a, a true pentagon. At the moment, it's a combinatorial pentagon where each edge here corresponds to one of these factorization channels of the original amplitude. So the original amplitude is in the bulk here of this pentagon. And then on, on this boundary, so this is a boundary where S34 equal to zero, I have this factorization here. And then I can take this, this edge here and then provide further factorizations where either uh, here S12 goes to zero, or when I go here, it's S15 goes to zero and end up in vertices of this pentagon. And I can associate uh, this full factorization into each of the vertex of my pentagon. Okay, so that the structure of singularities, so the combinatorial structure of singularities of this five point amplitude in this adjoint phi cube theory is just uh, is just a pentagon, and I can I can completely explain it just just looking at this at this pentagon here. Okay, so this pentagon and also this these labels here, uh, so these are just trivalent three uh, diagrams in some very particular, uh, I mean, on a disk, so the ordered, so not planar ones. Uh, this this uh, um, polytope here, or uh, polygon here, uh, is called an isosahedron, a two-dimensional isosahedron. And one of the tasks which you, which you have for the, in the tutorials is to do the same for six points and see that you get a similar statement that the, the the singularity structure, so the combinatorial, the combinatorial structure of singularities of the six points amplitude uh, also can be encoded in a polytope. In this case, the polytope is a three-dimensional polytope. Okay, and this three-dimensional polytope, again, is called an sahedron and uh, it's a very famous polytope in, uh, in physics and in mathematics. Okay, just to summarize what, what happened here is to the conclusions, and that after that I conclude for today, so conclusions is that to each partial, so to each partial uh, amplitude a n. So in this case, we just considered this. Sorry, uh, let me just go back here. We just considered the the partial amplitude with one, two, three, four, five ordered in this this way. But if I go back to my original. So the color of the composition, I could also have some other contributions coming, for example, from the partial amplitude uh, with ordering one, three, two, four, five. But my, the logic would be exactly the same. It's just the labeling of the external particles would be different. And instead of labeling them one, two, three, four, five, I would label them one, three, two, four, five. So the logic is exactly the same. So every partial amplitude, independent of, of, the, of the ordering in which it is, it, to every partial amplitude, I can associate a pentagon like this. Okay, so to, to each partial amplitude, uh, we can associate associate uh, a polytope in n minus three dimensions. So we studied n equal to five. In that case, it was two dimensional. Uh, you can. Uh, can almost immediately say what, what should be the, the one dimensional one, so for n equal to four. Uh, and for n equal to six, it will be a three dimensional object, which is quite complicated, but it can be derived just doing exactly the same, the same kind of calculations. So just by doing all the possible factorizations and further factorizations, you can find the combinatorial structure of this polytope. Okay, so, so we can associate a polytope to uh, n minus three dimensional. So n minus three dimensional polytope to every partial amplitude. And then faces of these polytopes, so the, the co-dimension one boundaries, uh, they correspond to singularities of uh, the amplitude. Okay, so uh, I can think about I can label the, the, each phase of this polytope just by a, a single factorization channel. And then uh, I can go further and then just consider this phase. On this phase, I still have some expression. Uh, so there's some 
the expression given by the residue of the original amplitude and do further, uh, uh, further uh, factorizations. Okay, so what we can do, we can continue like this. So we can continue like this, continue like this until uh, we arrive at uh, zero dimensional boundaries. Uh, which are just vertices. So these are just vertices of this of this object. So then the vertices are labeled by just like full factorizations. So are labeled by uh, complete factorizations of the amplitude. And in this particular case, uh, which we just considered here, uh, there are nothing else than uh, trivalent, uh, so trivalent three, uh, trivalent trees yeah, with n n external uh, vertices. Okay, so by accident uh, here they they correspond. Uh, you could interpret them also as. Uh, Feynman diagrams, so that the number of vertices is equal to the number of Feynman diagrams, which we have in our origin, original uh, description of the amplitude. But this story, it, it is true for any n. So if you now take six, seven, eight points, then you get a higher and higher dimensional object. But all the, um, all the singularity structure of this amplitude is encoded in, in the boundary structure of this uh, n minus three dimensional um, polytope. And at the moment, the, the statement is only at the combinatorial level. Uh, so I, I just wanted to tell you that there is some relation between the amplitude and geometry. But later on, we, we will be able to do the other way around. So we will be, we will be able to, to define a geometry. And then without doing any Feynman diagrams, uh, Feynman diagram calculations, extract the amplitude from, from there. So we will be able to define this, this pentagon directly in the, uh, in the kinematic space, so in the space of uh, Mandelstam's, and then associate some algebraic uh, uh, object to it, which, which will be a differential form from which we will be able to extract the amplitude. So the, the expression will be found here and, and also for higher number of points. Okay, so I stop for, for, for now, for today. I just wanted to motivate why geometry appears in this context. And uh, in the next lecture, so tomorrow, I will tell you uh, why we need these differential forms and what is their meaning. And then this will lead us to the definition of a, a positive geometry. So this will be focus on of tomorrow. Thank you very much, Tomek, for the very nice uh, introductory talk. Um, so yeah, we have some time for questions. We've already had a few, uh, but does anyone have any further questions? Uh, I have one, if it's possible. Um, can you discuss a bit the space of uh, Mandelstam variable? How many degrees of freedom there are? Um, I, I see in A5, you have five Mandelstam that are all independent, I think. I mean, uh, in, in general, it depends on the, uh, the, the space time, how many of them are independent, right? And there is also, um, uh, so at some point uh, you have also ground determinant conditions. So, so if you, for example, in in four dimensional space time, uh, all five would be independent here. Okay, but if you go to a six particle, so for six particles uh, you would have nine Mandel stems because there would be uh, so S S I J and then S I J K. Sorry, uh, I should say S I I plus one. And then AFS i i plus one i plus two. So there's six of those and three of those, okay, because of the amount of conservation. And so you you would think naively that there's nine degrees of freedom here, but then there is <clears throat> in four dimensions there is a gram determinant condition one in this case, and it reduces the dimensionality of this to eight. Okay, so. I, I should remember now what is the, the, the true answer. So I think that the true answer is that the dimensionality is, uh, I don't know if Robert is here, uh, 3n minus, 
I, I don't remember. So th there's there's three trimmers. Thank you. Yes, trimmers. That's that's the dimensionality. But in this context, uh, we are dimensional agnostic, really. Uh, so we we think about this S as completely independent, and all in all these geometry uh, considerations, that all the S's would be independent variables. Thank you. Uh, so for, for n equals six, uh, so you have uh, that your face sets are nine and not eight. That's correct. Yes, yes. Okay. and that, that's, that's, that's the task for today, so for you. So uh, you should find a three-dimensional polytope uh, with nine, nine faces. And uh, I, I already gave you a clue, so I can tell you that it will be 14 vertices. So 14 vertices, nine faces. But what you can do, you can just uh, derive using uh, Feynman diagrams, you can derive the, the answer for the, for the six particle amplitude. It will have 14 terms. And then you can start to take residues and you can see how it sort of factorize and just, just, just construct this three-dimensional object directly. And let me just point out something. I mean, I, I knew how to construct this one. So maybe it looked quite easy how, how, to, how to arrange these factorization channels. So, but if you notice, uh, this, this factorization which I took here is S12 going to zero, but this one I took S34 going to zero, this one S15, S23, and S45. Uh, that was done on purpose. I, I mean, the, the, the faces, in that case, this one dimensional edges, uh, they are ordered in a very particular way. So it's not that we can take I mean, the, the, the faces in the, for this three dimensional object, the faces will touch in a very particular way. Uh, and the way they touch will be given to you by the factorizations. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have perhaps a question which is related to the dimension in which uh, we are considering the theory. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with the, um, the three-point amplitudes that we considered before, because we said there are no three-point amplitudes which are non-trivial because there are no uh, Lorentz invariants that we can build up. Mm -hmm. But if we are in 3D, if I am not wrong, I think we could build something out of the levi civita tensor contracted with three momenta. Uh, does that not make sense for some reason, or is that a specific case which is uh, needs to be treated uh, independently? Uh, it, it has to be treated uh, separately. So, so uh, as I said, this 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 theory usually so by joint uh, scalar theory usually is constructed uh, uh, in N D. So there is no so there is something special happening in D equal to four. There is something special happening in D equal to three. So for all the integer numbers, there is something special, and. Uh, uh, but but we just treat it as d as, as, as a continuous parameter and don't worry about that. Okay, so okay. we want to have a story which is true for all the dimensions. Okay, thank you. Um, so in regular uh, phi cube, you would just sum across um, all permutations, right? So you wouldn't have an associate hedron or, or a nice geometric structure, um, but that would still be a sensible, you could still do a, a similar, you know, breaking it up into a <clears throat> Feynman diagram, sort of, or ZFW sort of thing, right? Or does that not make sense? Uh, I'm not sure if BCFW, I would not use BCFW uh, here. I mean, th there is some connection to BCFW, there's BCFW for this theory, but it's not what I, what I explained here. These factorizations are not BCFW factorizations. Okay, but, but you, you're right. I mean, you could take uh, just just ordinary phi cube, right? And the answer would be for for four points already. It would be one over s one two plus one over s one three plus one over s one four, right? That that's that's the answer. Now you can ask. So first of all, notice that there is a relation between the uh, dimensionality of this uh, of these polytopes. So so if I have a polytope here. Uh, uh, so for for A4, sorry, I, I discussed A5, so let me take A5. It's a 2D polytope, it's a pentagon, right? And if I, if I, if I think about the amplitude, then the amplitude has a pose which looks like this, plus four other terms. So the number of terms in the denominator is equal to the dimensionality of the, of the polytope, which we get at the end. 
Okay, and that's an important statement. So, uh, so for example, here I, I would have S12 plus S23. Uh, um, uh, can somebody tell me what the shape should be, one dimensional shape? Anybody knows? Is it just a line segment? It's a line segment, right? It has just two, two, point, two, two residues, and so either I go to one or to the other. So now, now notice that uh, if I want to have a similar description as this one, then uh, in this case, I would expect to have a one-dimensional object because there's just one residue. And after I take the residue, I should end up with a, 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 with a point, right? OK? So uh, there's a question. Uh, uh, how to find a one-dimensional object with three boundaries. Okay, and I would not know how to do that. So, uh, as far as I understand, there's uh, there's no way to associate a, a polytope in this case when you just take phi cube and not the the partial amplitudes where where the ordering is important, because you have three objects as uh, three residues, uh, but the object should be one-dimensional. So all one-dimensional objects, they have at most two boundaries. Unless okay. there are some, some, some glued together segments, but, but that, yeah, so I, there's no story like that. Yeah. So I have a perhaps a related question. Um, if I'm wondering if there are uh, conditions uh, on theories that, such that they would have a geometric interpretation if there are, if there are any conditions like that, we don't know them, really. So, I mean, you, you could imagine that um, you take any theory and you take uh, its amplitudes and you look at the amplitudes. It's written in some kinematic space, and in this kinematic space, there will be some singularities, right? So, so you know that the amplitude has singularities. So, you, you would say, so let's let's just uh, uh, just put the geometry with the boundaries at the singularities, the position of the singularities, and try to figure out what this uh, geometry is. It's it's much more difficult than than you, you can think, really. And in this case, I just described uh, a combinatorial structure. So maybe combinatorial structure still would be possible for all theories because. Uh, uh, now, even in that case, because when, when we start to talk about n equals to four superenemies, uh, uh, a three level already, uh, the object will not be a polytope. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure if, if for generic generic theory there there is I mean, it is possible to find a polytope. As as I said, for example, here, I mean, in this case, there is no polytope, right? So uh, unfortunately, we don't have any conditions. We know some theories where this works. So so by a joint phi cube or uh, this this version of it. Uh, N equals to four super n meals. Uh, not many more, really. Okay. So there's there's a, so there's a phi to the p, so the like the higher higher degree uh, inter interaction for scalar theories. There are some attempts there uh, where there are so-called Stokes polytopes where where I mean which can be found for amplitudes. But beyond that, we don't I mean that we don't know how to approach a generic theory. Okay, thank you. So I actually have a follow up on, on uh, your your answer. So at the beginning you said that it's it's not BCFW, um, but you you are doing it, it could like you're doing a recursion like BCFW, right? To break to continually factorize um, on you know on these in, in this smaller amplitudes. Mm -hmm. uh, are you using so you're using a different kind of factorization or? It's a different factorization. You, do, you don't you don't uh, modify the denominators in any way, right? You don't introduce this uh, the small deformation z, uh, and you don't consider the Cauchy theorem on, on the plane. That's that's a different story. However, there is, and I can find uh, maybe, maybe I just uh, posted on Slack. There is a way uh, to uh, to use BCFW like uh, uh, factorizations or, or uh, recursion relations to say something about this, uh, this object. But in this case, so here, the factorizations, uh, which we see, they somehow correspond to vertices here. When you consider BCFW recursion relation, what you will find, you will find that this pentagon here will be divided, will be triangulated into three pieces and each of these pieces here, so these three pieces will correspond to, BC, to a single BCFW term. So 
there is a meaning of PCFW recursion relations, but they are not this, this factorizations when you go to boundaries, but they are just triangulations of this associohedra. Okay. Um, and is there a name for the sort of recursion that, that you're doing? Uh, I, I'm not sure how to, how to call it. I mean, it's uh, just a, a basic statement about unitarity and, uh, uh, and locality, right? So we know that uh, at the position where the, where the, the Manda sums go to zero, the, the, the Feynman, Feynman rules, the Feynman diagrams, they just factorize. Okay, so that's, thank you. that's locality and, and unitarity of the theory. Yeah. Right, thanks. Okay, let's uh, end the discussion here for now. Uh, so thanks again to Atomic uh, for this great. Uh